Way back in 1893, Sharanda already had resolved that India should be free and that it should have complete independence from the, from the British. Why is this important? Let's not forget that the Congress came up with their Purna Swaraj resolution on the 29th of December in 1929 in the Lahore session. So think about Sharabindu talking about Purna Swaraj in 1907, that this idea of resisting the subjugation of India, you know, the spirit of Swaraj was never completely lost through the thousand years of our colonialism. And from there, Tilak said, Swaraj is my birthright, I should have it. Shurabindra talks about Swaraj. Gandhiji wrote Hind Swaraj in 1800 and, uh, 1909 in November. And uh, so this word came back into our vocabulary. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to inaugurate this series of lectures, which commemorates not just India at 75, but also Sri Aurobindo at 150. In my view, this is a never before, never after conjunction. They didn't give us an opportunity. On Sri Aurobindo's immense contribution to modern life, to modern civilization, to the future of the human race itself. So I feel very grateful for this opportunity. And to my young friends who are not sure why they're still sitting here, what I want to say to you is that uh, we sometimes feel that you know we are doing these things for India or Sri Aurobindo. But once you go into it a little deeply, you will discover that this is an opportunity for us actually to grow and to fulfill our own potential as human beings. It seems to me that is how I look at these opportunities, not just to share one's thoughts, but really to deepen one's own understanding of India and of uh, the work of Sherwood. So with these words, I just wanted to uh, once again thank Sampath Bhai for this initiative and thank IPPR for organizing this lecture series. We talk about Azadita Amrit Mahotsav, and it seems to me that even this phrase, Amrit, is actually from Sri And I can give you the quotation because he says in his, uh, in his, in his talk he gave in Nashik, he says that, and this was, this was a talk he gave on the 24th of January in 1908. It was two years actually before Gandhiji wrote in Swaraj, when the SS killed a man in Southampton, South Africa. Uh, Shurabindu made a speech in Nashik, Maharashtra. It's not very well known or famous speech, and in fact, he wouldn't have known of it had it not been for the CID. Somebody from the CID was present and gave notes on the speech, and then it was reported in a newspaper in Marathi the following day. But it is in the collected works of Shorabindu, the complete works of Shorabindu. Uh, so he says, uh, it was, as I said, reported in the Nashik Vrta in the next, the next morning. So he says, if we do not acquaint ourselves with the object in view, this Swaraj, I'm afraid, we 30 crores of people will become extinct. Swaraj is life. It is nectar in salvation. So that nectar, Amrit, I think comes from the speech. Maybe it's unintentional. We don't know where they got it from. But I found that in uh, 1908, Sharabindo had used nectar as a description for Swaraj. Swaraj in a nation is the breath of life. Without breath of life, a man is dead. So also without Swaraj, a nation is dead. Swaraj being the life of a nation, it is essential for it. So it's a very short uh, talk that I have prepared on Shurabindu's idea of Swaraj. So let me just do that. Then I will 
elaborate on it with a few, you know, uh, other ideas. So I'm, I'm calling it Bhavani Mandir Revisited because Prabhupada wrote a very interesting pamphlet called Bhavani Mandir in 1905 when he was working for the Maharaja of Baroda. The sort of nationalism phase actually began in earnest when he became the inaugural principal of the National College in Kolkata, which then became, of course, Jadavpur University. Shaurabandhu elaborates on the meaning of Swaraj in this speech. He says, if we do not acquaint ourselves with the object in view, which is Swaraj, I'm afraid we 30 crores of people will become extinct. Swaraj is life, it is nectar and salvation. Swaraj in a nation is the breath of life. Without breath, a man is dead. So without Swaraj, a nation is dead. Swaraj being the life of a nation, it is essential for it. But the roots of Shorabandu's experiments and ideas for free in India go back much farther, even to his days as a Cambridge undergraduate. So he was part of a, a secret society called the Lotus and the Tiger, and he attended its first meeting in 1893. So he was born in 1872. Uh, so in 1893, he was only 21 years of age. He was doing the classical tripod at Cambridge, and he attended the secret society. And of course, the secret society never met a second time. So it was an abortive attempt. But much later, when, when I talk about the speech he made in Nashe, Shurabindu was associated with two secret societies, the Anushilan Samiti and Juganta. And his own brother, Barindra, was learning how to make bombs. Anyhow, so the next kind of vignette. The point I'm trying to make is, way back in 1893, Shurabindu already had resolved that India should be free and that it should have complete independence from the, from the British. Why is this important? Let's not forget that the Congress came up with their Purna Swaraj resolution on the 29th of December in 1929 in the Lahore session. So think about Shurabindu talking about Purna Swaraj 1907, but also thinking about it way back in 1893. When he was in the Maharaja of Baroda's service, he was involved in some experiments. One of them was a seance. Okay, so what happens in a seance? You are supposed to communicate with people who are dead, who are on the other side. And the medium of the seance was his own brother Barendra. And he received an intriguing message. Who is Sri Ramakrishna? So imagine Sri Aurobindo trying to communicate with the dead spirit of Sri Ramakrishna through a seance. Okay? And his brother himself was a medium. What was the message he got? He got me two words Mandir Gado, you know, make a temple. What does it mean? It's an intriguing message. And Sri Aurobindo interpreted it as a commandment to propagate a new revolutionary creed based on the consecration of the temple to Mother India. This would not be a physical temple, much as a nationwide movement in which Mother India was invoked as Bharat Shakti. Who is it that first talked about Mother India? And there's the famous song that we all know. Who is it that talked about that? The nation as a goddess. No idea. You don't know Bande Matram? Who wrote Bande Matram? Banke. So he wrote it as an independent song, but it was also part of Ananda Mat. Shorabhanda was very influenced by Banke. In fact, in Hindu Prakash in 1894, after he came back from England, he wrote a series of essays called Rishi Banke. Because it was Bankim who conceptualized the nation as a goddess. You know? So it is a Sanatan Parampara that you can create goddesses. Okay? Just as gods and goddesses create you. Many times in Delhi, uh, you know, it's very difficult to find parking. So you can have a parking goddess. So you pray to the parking goddess and maybe you'll get a parking slot. Or you can pray to the examination goddess. Okay? You can try. Anyhow, so it is Bunkin who created a goddess 
and called Mother India, as it were. And then we have this beautiful song, Bande Mata, which is homage to the mother, okay? And Shaurabhanga builds on it. And he talks about Bharat Shakti. And he wrote a pamphlet called Bhavani Mandir. How do we know he wrote the pamphlet? Because when he was arrested in the Alipur bomb trial, this was a part of the evidence, this pamphlet called Bhavani Mandir. But it was signed by Barindra. It was Barindra's brother's signature on it. And, and uh, on the cover. But there is what he says in, in Bhavani Mandir. He says, we in India fail in all things for want of Shakti. So this is true even today. Wherever we fail, it's because we lack Shakti, we lack power, we lack energy, we lack the will to succeed. Okay? He says, we have all things else, but we are empty of strength, void of energy. We have abandoned Shakti and are therefore abandoned by Shakti. The consequences of such weakness, weakness are disastrous. The heading of another section of us. Okay, so this is important for all of us who are in the intellectual field. Shurabhim says our knowledge is a dead thing for want of Shakti. So all of us who spent all our time as teachers or students, we have to reflect on this. We want to be a Vishwa Guru, but we are in a state of terrible intellectual decline in India. Okay, we don't produce new ideas, we repeat old ideas, and we don't respect the life of them. We respect power, we respect money, we respect other such things. We don't respect the intellect, we don't respect, we may call our university Rishi Bhul, but are we really going to produce Rishis? Maybe some by will, but I don't know. But as a country, we don't respect knowledge, we don't respect the intellect. And uh, this is something that Sharudanda talked about 115 years ago. And for us, knowledge is only instrumental. We pass an exam, whether it's the NET or the Central uh, you know, CUET or the IAS. Knowledge is instrumental. You pass an exam, you get a job. That's all knowledge is for. We don't love knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And the ancient Indians did. That's why we were at the forefront of knowledge. We be really at the back. There is no Indian university which is in the top 100 in the world, according to the QS rankings. Okay, not a single one. And IISC and the others, some of the IITs, are not in the first 100. So it's something for us to think of. And Shorobhanda says, our knowledge is a dead thing for want of Shakti. And then he says that our knowledge is inadequate and cannot save us. Why? Because, and I'm quoting him, it is a dead knowledge, a burden under which we are bowed, a poison which is corroding us, rather than as it should be a staff to support our feet and a weapon in our hands. Why is he saying that? Why is he so harsh? And his answer is, again I'm quoting him, our knowledge then is weighed down the heavy load of tamas. Okay? It lies under the curse of impotence and inertia. It's for you to think about how true it is today. It is Swami Vivekananda who said that in India, sattva it is actually tamas masquerading as the something to think about. What you really need is najas. And Vivekananda said, go and play football, don't read the Gita. Build up some muscle. Then Shalbuka comes to something that the Indians are very easy and very prone to do, which is devotion. Whoever it is, will pedestalize it. Okay? Whether it's our Prime Minister or Sri you know, We are great devotees, but our devotion is not sincere. You know, because in our hearts, we don't feel the devotion. We just do it. Okay? Whether it's also for the Tiranga. It's for you to think about. And why is he saying, what is Sri Aurobindo saying? If India has been a knowledge society for millennia, we are also not lacking in bhakti or devotion. But, and I'm quoting Shurabindu, our bhakti cannot live and work for want of shakti. So our bhakti or devotion is also weak. You know, without strength, even devotion is useless. And Shurabindu says, in the absence of shakti, we cannot concentrate, we cannot direct, 
we cannot even preserve it. Dharana, the Yoga Sutra, then Dhyana, then Samadhi. We can't concentrate. Isn't it true? Today, you know, we are always on our phone and uh, you try to read a book and in 30 seconds your mind is wandering off. And my own students tell me sometimes, don't give us fat books to read. Okay? Give us only summaries. So we are not able to concentrate. And this is what Shurabindu says. But the good news is, what he's saying is, no man or nation need be weak unless he chooses. No man or nation need perish unless he deliberately chooses extinction. And luckily for us, I think, we are free today, thanks to people like Shurabindu and many other freedom fighters that we've heard about. But do we deserve this freedom? What are we doing to make our country, our civilization, and our incomplete renaissance, okay, what are we doing to finish it? What are we being, uh, doing to make our country great today? So what Shurabindu says is that the cultivation and the exaltation of strength is the crying want of Indians. And that was the motto of Bhavani Mandir, an idea that harkens back to Swami Vivekananda's injunction. He says, strength, is, strength and manliness are virtue, weakness and cowardice are sin. And he also says, this is Swami Vivekananda, this is a great fact. Strength is life, weakness is death. Strength is felicity, life eternal, immortal. Weakness is constant strain and misery. Weakness is death. I already mentioned how Shorabindo had elaborated his idea of Purnaswaraj, a complete political independence. He also did it in a, a two-part essay called The Doctrine of Passive Resistance. Okay? Because in 1906, in December, Dadavai Navroji, when he gave the valedictory address to Congress in Kolkata, said that we want Swaraj. But nobody, nobody defined what Swaraj was. Even Gandhiji in his Swaraj translated it as Indian home rule. And for many years, they were negotiating whether it would be dominion status within the empire, some kind of adjustment with the British. It's only sure that we said we want the kind of independence that Britain has. Full independence. And he said it long before the Congress came out with that resolution. So when we talk about this conjuncture of India at 75 and Sherwood at 150, is it an accident that India's independence is also Sri Aurobindo's birthday? Certainly Sri Aurobindo did not think so. In an address that he gave to the All India Radio to Chinapalli, he says, 15th August is the birthday of free India. To me personally, it must be naturally gratifying that this date, which was notable only for me, because it was my own birthday celebrated annually by those who have accepted my gospel of life, should have acquired this vast significance. So I invite all of you to go to Sri Aurobindo's Five Dreams. It's a great speech he gave on the eve of India's independence in 1947. He elaborates what his five dreams are. One of them is, of course, India's independence. But he says this independence is truncated because India is still divided. And talking about K. M. Munshi, who founded the Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan in 1938, he was one of the few people who had the occasion to meet Sri Aurobindo in 1950. Sri Aurobindo left his body on the 5th of December 1950, and K. M. Munshi was the central minister, the cabinet minister, went to Pondicherry with Morati Bhai Desai and had the privilege of meeting Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo makes a prophecy that the partition of India is not a permanent thing. So you can read that record. It is in Nirod Baran's, uh, you know, uh, record of Sri Aurobindo, uh, of Sri Aurobindo for the youth. That's the name of the book. You can take a look at it. But it's also very interesting that K. Munshi was a student of Sri Aurobindo in Baroda College because Sri Aurobindo was the vice principal of Baroda College. Go to Baroda or Badodara, as it is called today. You must go to this building called Baroda College. It's a magnificent building with the second largest dome in India. Which is the largest dome in India? Thank you, sir. 
So this is the second largest dome in Baroda College. So go and see it. It's still a very inspiring place for sure when the talk. But Tim Munshi was born in, if I'm not mistaken, in 1888. So he's 15 years younger than Shurabindo. Attended his class, and this is what he had to say about Shurabindo. I want to read you a little uh, passage of his reminiscences of uh, Shurabindo. He says, and I quote Tim Munshi, I remember only one occasion when I directly talked to Professor Arvind Ghosh. How could nationalism be developed? He pointed to a wall map of India and said something to this effect. Look at that map. No map, but imagine a map of India. At that time, one divided India. Look at that map. Learn to find in it the portrait of Bharat Mata. The cities, mountains, rivers, and forests are the material which go to make up our body. The people inhabiting the country are the cells which go to make up our living tissues. Our literature is her memory and speech. The spirit of her culture is her soil. The happiness and freedom of her children is her salvation. Behold Bharat as the living mother. Meditate upon her and worship her in the ninefold way of her. So I think this is a very profound statement for all of us today because when he writes to his wife Rinalini about his three madnesses, this is a letter of his on 30th August 1905 and he tells his wife that he is afflicted by three madnesses. He says one of his madnesses is this, while others look upon their country as an inert piece of matter, a few meadows and fields, forests and hills and rivers, look upon her as the mother. What would a son do if a demon sat on his mother's breast and started sucking her blood? Would he quietly sit down to his dinner, amuse himself with his wife and children? Or would he rush out to deliver his mother? I know. I have the strength to deliver this fallen race. It is not physical strength. I'm not fighting. I'm not going to fight with sword or gun. But it is the strength of knowledge. This feeling is not new in me. It is not of today. I was born with it. It is in my very marrow. Now, so this is a very interesting letter. I invite you to read it. But what Shurman was saying is that it is knowledge which is going to save us. And he has that knowledge. What is that knowledge? I invite you to try and read Shurman's works. And some people say it is the knowledge of the super mind, how the whole of humanity will be transformed and have higher consciousness. But even before we reach that far, it is certainly the knowledge of how to complete our unfinished renaissance. And it is not by rejecting modernity or what the West has discovered. You know, it is not by trying to return to some golden age in the past. Simply reconnecting with what we've lost. It is something much more complicated and much more difficult. It is really the assimilation of whatever is available in the world and making it your own through a process of hard work and engagement. So it is neither rejection nor imitation. It is neither subservience nor defiance. It is the third way. And uh, Shurabindo has a sense of this great mission because he's, if you read the secret of the Veda, you will see how he comes up with a completely new hermeneutics, completely new way of reading the Veda. Because he says after Shankara, the understanding of the Veda got split into Karma Kanda, which is only doing for rituals, being done for rituals, and the Vedanta, which Shankara said, you know, was enough for your salvation, or for teleological purpose. And it is Shurabindo who reunifies, you know, the great knowledge of the Veda. But you should also see his only Sanskrit poem, Bhavani Bharati, 99 verses, that Sampath Thai has recited incarnate word, where he starts with the same metaphor of a demon sucking the blood, you know, of Mother India, and how the children of India must rise and save her from this horrible ogre, this creature. 
And uh, uh, of course, we paid a terrible price for independence, as the Minister of State just reminded us. I think the figures of 2 million are vastly exaggerated by the partition industry. But even so, whether it's 200,000 or 2 million, it was too high a price to pay. And this is where we can bring in K.M. Munshi, who resigned from the Congress because he did not agree with Gandhiji's idea of non-resistance to violence. Because Gandhiji said, if uh, the Muslims come and attack you during the partition riots, you should not resist them. With the result that Congress workers usually ran away, you know. And K. Munshi wrote to Gandhiji, said, this is terrible. So Gandhiji said, uh, you know, if you don't agree, you should resign from the Congress because the Congress is for non-violence. K. Munshi resigned. And Gandhiji and he were still very good friends. In fact, he considered Gandhiji his guru. So it was a time when people disagreed with each other. And certainly, Shorabindu disagreed with Gandhiji on his, I would call it, fetishization of nonviolence. I've written a book on Gandhiji's last days. It's called The Death and Afterlife of Mahatma Gandhi. And when he came to Delhi on the 20th of September, after quelling the riots in uh, Calcutta, uh, you know, in his prayer meetings, you see that he acknowledges that his idea of nonviolence failed. And when the raiders invade Kashmir, he tells Jawala Nehru to send the troops, to airlift the troops to Srinagar. And because of that airlift, Srinagar was saved. Because they have come right up to Pathankot. They were rioting and raping in Pathankot. You can read the record. So Gandhiji gave up on non-violence. Except that he said, let the state have the monopoly on violence. So he goes to the mosque in Daryaganj and says, give up your weapons. You're now a part of India. It is the responsibility of the state to protect you. And he says, support the Home Minister, Sardar Balavita. Anyhow, so Shorabindu disagreed with Gandhiji. And he said that in India, we never renounce violence completely for dharma. For him, the ideal was Krishna, who exhorted Arjuna to fight. Of course, Gita was the favorite book of Gandhiji too. But for Gandhiji, Gita was entirely an internal battle between different parts of your own psyche. Anyhow, so all of this happened in India, and the partition was a terrible loss. Uh, and uh, maybe if he had followed Shorabindo, there might not have been a partition. If Stratford trips came to India, Shorabindo said, remember he had said, we want only Kurdaswara. But he said, no, accept dominion status. But the Congress said, no. He launched the Quit India movement, and uh, of course, Subhash Bose's Azad Hind Pod lost in Kohima, uh, and uh, that's the history of uh, India. We could not defeat the British, they left. Okay? And even, even now, it is called the transfer of power. It's not called, it was not a revolution which pushed them out. Now I come to a very interesting part of Shirobindo. Shobindo's life, and he was incarcerated in Alipur jail from 1800 and, uh, from 1908 to 1909, when he had a number of spiritual experiences. And he said, after he got out of jail, he gave a famous speech in Uttarpada, okay, to the Dharma Rakshini Sabha. And that is where he said that when it is said that India should expand and extend herself, it is the Sanatan Dharma that shall expand, extend itself over the world. It is for dharma and by the dharma that India exists. But for sure, even though the Sanatana dharma was not a narrow or sectarian creed, he says that that which we call Hindu religion is really the eternal religion because it is the universal religion which embraces all others. If a religion is not universal, it cannot be eternal. A narrow religion, a sectarian religion, an exclusive religion can only live for a limited time and a limited purpose. This is the one religion that can triumph over materialism by including and anticipating discoveries of science and the speculations of philosophy. So here's another speech that I invite everyone to read, the Uttarpada speech. And, and he says that 
the Sanatan Dharma that is nationalism. I think this sums up Shurabindo's idea of Swaraj. Swaraj is really ultimately a spiritual idea. That is what it was in our Upanishads, in the Chandogya Upanishad, the India Upanishad, in the Bhadaranya Upanishad, and in the Kaushitiki Upanishad. It is also available in the Rig Veda, 180. There is a whole sutta on Swaraja, but it describes the qualities of Indra. Archar Anuswaraja, all the uh, lines end with that refrain. And Sri Aurobindo revives this idea, the spiritual transformation of humanity being the real purpose of Swaraj. So Swaraj is not just political independence or even economic independence, but Swaraj is self-illumination, is self-realization. It is the psychic awakening. It is the understanding of our true nature. And if you read the Taitiya Upanishad, it is actually said that Indra was able to defeat the Asuras only when he knew who he was. So self-knowledge is essential. You cannot become Virat without being Svarat. So Svarat is self-restraint. It is also resistance to evil. And you see something similar in Gandhiji's in Svarat as well. But uh, we can end by looking at the strange circumstances which made this ancient word become a part of the vocabulary of modern India. And, this, and the strange circumstance was that uh, there was a disciple of uh, Sri Aurobindo, an early disciple. He was a Maharashtrian who lived in, uh, who was born and lived in, in uh, Bengal, he was born in Devgarh, and his name is Deuskar. And uh, this gentleman was also Parindra's teacher in the Devgarh school. And he wrote a book in Bangla called Desher Katha, okay, which became a very, very popular book. It, it sold uh, 10,000 copies in one year. And, uh, and not only that, it went into five or six editions very fast, and then it was banned. You know, it was banned by the British because that was a book in which what Devskar did is he, he disillusioned the youth of India of their great fascination for the British. He showed how the British had pauperized India, something that Dada Bhai Narodhi also wrote later in a book called, I think he, it was, it was a book, I think, what is the name of Dada Bhai Nabrati's book, Un-British Rule in India, Indian Poverty and the Un-British Rule in India. Anyhow, that's the first book where the drain theory of how colonialism drained our wealth was outlined in great detail. But the, the person I'm talking about, his name is Sakharam Ganesh Dhiruskar, 1869-1912. Now, he wrote this book, Deshya Katha, in 1904, and it was banned, as I told you. But Devskar, inspired by Rokmanya Tilak and others, he started organizing the Shivaji Utsav in Bengal and he wrote a biography of Shivaji. It's interesting how Brahma Banda uh, Upadhyay also wrote about Swaraj in his uh, newspaper called Sandhya. And uh, prior to that, in, in 1857, we have the first biography or the first book on Shivaji. Uh, which was written in 1857, the year of the Great Revolt. And this was a book written by a very interesting man, whom we have completely forgotten today, Bhude Mukhopadhyaya. Has anybody heard of Bhude Mukhopadhyaya? He wrote another very interesting book called Swapna Labdhir Bharatiya Itihas, which was published in 1897. So it was a book in which he imagined India's independence, uh, or India's history had the British not come, you know, to India. So these are books that we have to go back to and, and read deeply. But the point I'm trying to make is that Shivaji and the Marathas had already become a figure in India's imagination in Bengal in the 19th century. And this was another way to remember them because otherwise they were only raiders. Remember, Bengal was ruled by the Nawabs. Ali Vardi Khan was the Nawab of Bengal when the Marathas and the Peshwa were raiding Bengal and extracting Chauth and Sardesh Muslim. 
So people in Bengal and Odisha don't like the Marathas. They consider them, you know, what are they called? Bargis or something, you know? There's a, there's a word for them, raiders, they're called raiders. But here in Bengal, they try to revive the idea of Shivaji. And uh, Shivaji's notion of Hindavi Swaraj, which actually went back to Krishna Raya and uh, possibly to Vidyaranya, who was the guru of, uh, I think, Harihar and Bukharaya. So, what I'm simply trying to say is that this idea of resisting the subjugation of India, you know, the spirit of Swaraj is never completely lost through the thousand years of our colonialism. And somehow it was reignited in Bengal by a person we've forgotten today, whose name is Deuskar. And uh, it got picked up by Dada Bhai Nabroji on the 29th of December in 1906. And from there, Tilak said, Swaraj is my birthright, I should have it. Shurabhindra talks about Swaraj. Gandhiji wrote in Swaraj in 1800 and, uh, 1909 in November. And uh, so this word came back into our vocabulary and our imagination. And finally, as I've explained, Sri Aurobindo picked it up, gave it uh, its deeper spiritual meaning and linked it up, not only with the independence of India, but with the transformation of the world itself. Because the rise of India for Sri Aurobindo was one step, a necessary step, in the transformation of planetary life or not. So with these words, I thank you all very much. And I also invite younger people to read the works of Sri Aurobindo.